So this is PB equals NRT translated. Uh, just, just so we're all clear, I tend to call this Pepner. Uh, I think it's a little more memorable, even though most people never forget this. I think that this is a great example of what we're trying to do here. This is something that a lot of people could be taught and be tested on and be successful on a test, but really not know what they're doing. And so that's what we're trying to, to compensate and fix in this in, in these in this series um, is what does this mean? What's the point of this equation? What conceptually am I supposed to derive from this? And there's a lot that we can derive from this particular one. Uh, but I want to focus on one, one really key thing. So, so most people get introduced to this equation, uh, and you might have done kinetic molecular theory first or something along those lines, but maybe you don't really understand what those rules were, the purpose behind it. And then we get into here, we have pressure times volume equals moles times a constant times temperature, and our constant can be different values. It can be 8.314, or it can be 0 0.0821. And each of those has different units, but they're both constants, and we need to match them if it's kilopascals or if it's atmospheres. And people can do that without understanding what it is that they're doing, okay? And then a lot of people will see gas law demonstrations, and, and some of these things will get connected. Okay, if pressure changes like this, then temperature must have done this, and things like that. But I want to go through something that's very critical about this equation, and that is there is no mention anywhere in it of what type of gas it is. So nowhere in there does it say, oh, well, when you have helium gas, and you want to find the pressure of a helium gas in its storage tank, you do this. And the reason for that is because to this equation, all gases are the same. And I think we don't stress that point enough, and it should be a little taking aback for a second. Are all gases the same? No. But with respect to the things that are calculated in this particular equation, they are. Now, in order for that to be true, we have to make some assumptions. So if you go back and you look at those kinetic molecular theory things, where they have the list and they say, you know, collisions are elastic and particles are no volume and things like that. And you didn't really get what they were saying, or maybe you understood the sentence, but you didn't know what the point of it was. The point of those statements is to set up a set of rules of assumptions that make all gases the same. Now, if you look and you take a gas and you plug in its variables into this, barring extreme circumstances, this thing will work for every single gas. There are a couple conditions where this breaks down, and we'll look at those in a little bit. But the big idea behind this is that any gas you have, if you have a mole of gas and it's at standard pressure and standard temperature, you have 22.4 liters. Okay? If it's not at those conditions, you can still use this equation to be able to figure things out. If you take a higher level class, then you have a chance that they might actually take a container and put a particle in it and start to go through and show how often it will collide with the walls and how fast it's going, how that connects to temperature. And they'll go through and they'll derive a very similar equation to this. And it's PB equals NKT, where K is a Boltzmann constant and N is the number of molecules instead of moles. And that, that then transcribes into this when we adjust the Boltzmann constant by a mole to turn into R. Um, and, so, and so in this particular example, there are some assumptions that you have to make in order for this to work. You have to assume that when gas molecules hit things, they don't stick, that they collide and they bounce off. And that was, that was the point where it said that all collisions are elastic. And you can't have gas molecules hit and then vibrate, and you can't have them hit and stick. Okay? And then the other thing is, there's a volume to this container. So let's say it's exactly one liter. Well, if this thing is a large molecule, which is unlikely, but, but as I have more and more of them, the actual size of the container shrinks because this space is being taken up by these. Think of it like if you filled this thing up with sand up to there. Now the volume accessible is only this top part. Well, even without the sand, if I just have a few molecules in there, then the total of those take up a little bit of space. We assume that that space is zero. Now, when does that fall apart? Okay, well there are two times where that falls apart. One is at high pressure, and the other is at low temperature. 
Now, in my head, the way that I remember that is just those both signify to me that I'm getting close to being a liquid. And when things start to approach liquid state, that's when this whole equation becomes a mess. The other way we could look at this, though, is what things do not follow this or this very well, okay? What things don't collide and, and not stick? What things are sticky, okay? Well, in chemistry, sticky is often referred to as intermolecular forces, okay? And so things with strong intermolecular forces are going to start to, to, to deviate from this equation. So what's something with strong intermolecular forces? A hydrogen bond. So if we have steam, then steam plugged into this equation, especially when it's near the temperature of the boiling point, it's not going to work very well. We want something with dispersion forces only. Okay? We want the temperature to be well above the boiling point in order for this equation to work. As this starts to fall apart, that's when we have to go through and we now have to account for the differences in the gases based on intermolecular forces. The other thing that's going to make these things fall apart is large molecules. Okay, if you have a really big molecule, then that's going to take up more space of your container, and so therefore this is going to start to fall apart, and your volume that you have accessible is actually smaller than the size of your container. Um, sulfur hexafluoride is a big molecule, uh, and that's the gas that you can breathe in, and it will accentuate the lower tones coming out of your voice. Uh, it sounds really cool, um, but that would be something that would, that would not work well for the ideal gas level. Now, nowhere in there have I written that yet, but the ideal gas law is based off the fact that all gases are the same when we ignore a couple things. Okay. And usually that assumption is really, really good. Now, at high pressures and low temperatures, or if you have a really sticky molecule, or a very large molecule, that will break down. But most of these is to a minor degree, and these it really has to be a really, really high pressure, or a really, really low temperature relative to the boiling point for that whole thing to fall apart. When that does fall apart, there's another equation, the Van der Waals equation, which does take into account the stickiness, okay? It gives it a, a little factor, a little A factor that you can plug into it, and the size of the, of the molecule itself, which you get a B factor to plug into that equation. Okay? Now, when you're going through, doing calculations with this is fantastic, and I'm, I'm sure we're all very impressed by your ability to do an algebra problem. But when you get into the higher levels of chemistry, you want to be able to analyze situations where you're comparing variables, and when that equation will start to fail, and why. Why at high pressure does this thing not work anymore? Well, in order to have high pressure, that means you have lots of collisions, okay? And, and what that means in terms of this particular volume here, if you're having lots of collisions, is that the molecules are tightly packed. And so you're having molecules everywhere. I mean, apparently I'm not drawing them. But if you have molecules everywhere, then what that means is, is those molecules are occupying a significant quantity of your space. And so your volume accessible is no longer the same as what you thought it was. At low temperature, when these molecules are moving at low temperature, that means they're moving very slowly. Okay? So if a molecule is drifting along, and here's a molecule drifting along, when they collide, they have the opportunity then to get very close and to stick together. And so, and so that, that stickiness of them will, will reduce the pressure that they exert on other things. And so the pressure then will be adjusted because of that low temperature. Okay? So when you're doing ideal gas law, you're probably going to start out by going through and looking at you know, units, conversions, and making sure everything plugs in in the correct manner, figuring out what R value to use. But that's not chemistry. That's, that's problem solving a little bit, and algebra a little bit, and maybe a little bit of chemistry familiarity. But when you're doing this, you also want to go through and you want to look at why when the temperature goes up, does my pressure go up? Why when the volume goes down, does my pressure go up? And why does this equation work for all gases? Why are they all the same? They're not really all the same. So what did I have to say about each gas in order to make them all the same? And how valid is that assumption? Okay. And you'll find the answers to those if you look a little bit. Okay. There's lots of good graphs that show as pressure changes, when does this equation fall apart? Um, and as, as uh, temperature changes, when does this equation fall apart? Okay. 